Well, good evening, family and friends, new faces, new friends. We welcome you all. So, I, I'm going to assume that you guys came expecting something to happen, yeah? Yeah, yeah that's what I want to hear. Yes, something's going to happen. That's why we came. We came expecting to see God move to heal, to manifest his spirit in different ways tonight. So I'm going to encourage you to stand up, to worship with us, to see what God has to offer us this morning, have it this evening. Amen? Amen. <laughs> to share with you Psalm 98. This is a, a command, a declaration, what God calls from us and reveals to us. It says, sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. The Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. He has remembered his promise to love and to be faithful to Israel. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with the heart, with the harp and melodious songs, with trumpets and the sounds of the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord and the King. Let the sea and everything within it shout its praises. Let the earth and all living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands in glee. Let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord. And let us join in with singing of the angels. Praise our God and King. Amen? So we got a chorus to sing. I'm going to teach you a little song. We want to sacrifice and surrender ourselves to give God free reign to what he would do in our lives. Amen? Amen.
Lord, we came to experience you, to know your heart, to be touched and impacted by you in a new way. God, we want to see you move. We want to know you in a more intimate, deeper way. God, we ask that as my testimony comes forth, that your word be shared, that you be glorified, that you be bragged upon through your works. God, we thank you for the mighty things that you do to save, to claim loss, to heal the broken. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers all, that washes away our sins and claims us to your family. Again, Lord, we thank you and praise you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I didn't get instructions. How's this working? I was going to say. You split the switch and Jerry will take it from there. <laughs> Pastor Brian is the tech guy. <laughs> oh. You tuck him wherever you like. Oh, sweet girl. Hey, there we go. I found the switch. It was right in front of me the whole time. All right. So thank you guys for coming out to. <coughs> experience, to hear, to find out what it is that God has done, what he is doing, how he works, and it's just amazing as I was putting together my testimony, like, it's still nerve-wracking, I've definitely got some nerves, I'm very anxious about sharing parts of this, um, but a lot of how you guys know is like, oh, drug addict met Jesus, and now like God's working through your life and things like that. And and I want to share that it's not been an easy journey at all. <laughs> like, yeah, I met Jesus and things got better, but it was still a struggle. It still is today. It's still a fight. And every one of you is also in that fight. So this isn't just a story about me. It's how God has worked in my life, but how he can also work in your lives. And there's scripture in here. This is going to be like a, a testimony and a message wrapped in one. So I encourage you to take notes how God can move in your life and benefit you as well. So um, rewind. <laughs> uh, back to when I was still partying, still using um I was doing drugs, I became a heroin addict, and very quickly became a trafficker of heroin. Um, I was the one driving large amounts back and forth from Columbus to Detroit, wherever it needed to go so I could get my fix, so I could stay well. So through that mess, um, I had moved into a duplex, and my neighbor um, in the duplex, cool dude, we hung out, started to get, get to know each other, and he invited me fishing. All right, sure, let's go fishing. So, mind you, I'm still using high in the middle of the night. We're talking about the stars and stuff. And, and I gave my uh, life to Christ at the edge of a reservoir in the middle of the night. And I would love to say that I was delivered from there. I had no withdrawals, and everything was awesome. That was not the case. I was saved. I was delivered from thoughts, but when it came to addiction to the substance that was still there, I had to fight for a good three years at least. I'd be clean for a little while and something would happen. I'd be like, I don't know why I used, I just did. And it's taken me to this point to realize that through the years of rehabs and detoxes, being in jail and, and processing what's going on in my life, the drugs were just a coping mechanism. We all have coping skills and mechanisms that we use. Some are healthier than others. I chose some really unhealthy ones 
but I thought they were working really well. Lo and behold, they were just delaying the inevitable, either death or coming face to face with who I had become through drugs, through the world, through addiction. So with drugs and all addictions being that coping mechanism that allows us to avoid situations, emotions, that uncomfortable thoughts of processing things, um, that allows us to be physically present but not mentally present. Our phones are the same thing, you know, like just pull it out. I don't, I don't want to be involved with this. <laughs> I want to avoid interacting with somebody face to face. It's acceptable in our culture, but it's insanely dangerous. Because in the time that Sean, who was my neighbor at the time, um, he could have very <coughs> easily you know, distracted himself with his phone. But instead, while we were out fishing in the middle of the night, he took that time to explain the maker of the stars. He took time to explain that <coughs> even though I was sick and I was hurting and I wanted it all to be over, that there was hope and there was somebody that loved me unconditionally no matter what. And we think like, oh, well, our parents, we get that from them. To, yes, to an extent, but God's love is so much more than that. It is so much bigger and all-consuming than we could ever imagine. So, in taking away my numbing mechanism, I found out <coughs> what it was that I was running from. It was all those bad feelings, those emotions, that the, the flood of thoughts of things that I have done over the years, the emotions and the overwhelmingness, sadness and anger just consumed me. And I didn't have a way out anymore. I didn't have a drug to hide it. And in this time, I was asking why. Why God, why me? Why did I have to suffer? Why did I have to be addicted? Why am I going through this? And here's the short of a long conversation throughout months. But he says, why not you? You've already been through all this trauma, this abuse from your childhood. You've already been through the worst of it. Just finish the process. He says, I just want you to heal. And you'll get past what's holding you back. Oh God, I don't even know what's holding me back. How can I move on from there? Because, oh, but I'm faithful to my child. So through um, recovery of things, mind you, it's not just what we can do. Like going to counselors and doctors, people who know what they're doing, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, wherever it comes from, God is faithful. He gave us doctors for a reason. Okay? God is good all the time. So what he's revealed to me through my healing and this process is that my childhood trauma, abuse, abandonment, neglect, misunderstandings that children have um, form perceptions and uh, emotional stunts. Like, uh, say at age four, something traumatic happened to you and um, you don't process that properly because what four-year-old can really process a trauma? So however we respond to that trauma is how we carry that throughout our lives. So something triggers that feeling and we go back to the four-year-old, not knowing how to handle our emotions, not knowing how to talk about things. Heck, how do we even identify what it is that we're feeling or what we're going through sometimes. So I've been on a journey to find out that the learning disorder that I had 
It's not a disorder. I just think differently than most people. The personality disorder that has manifested from traumas and from things that happened when I was a child, like I struggle with them. Like that's real, right in my face. But awareness, knowing that I have these obstacles regularly, knowing that my brain is wired to think a certain way, usually negatively, right off the bat. I was thinking, God, how, how is this gonna get any better when my default is bad? When my default is sad? When my default is run and hide? And he brought me to um, an, a new understanding of guilt and of shame. So a lot of us know guilt, like if something happens, we can say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. That's easy enough, right? But some of us have it a little worse than guilt. We're stuck with this shame monkey on our backs. And it's not just like a, a little bit of shame, like, oh, I feel bad because that was, that was bad. It's like, I'm sorry that was bad because I am the mistake. That's my default. I am the mistake. I said, man, God, how? Why? If I think in the core of my being that I am the mistake, how is it going to get better? So as he's revealing things to me, he says, part of this shame is what caused your hurt. Somebody else's shame made them hurt me. Somebody else's guilt made them say something to hurt. And I have taken that upon myself. That's a hard thing to get through. But God says to get past the shame, past the guilt, we need to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit through vulnerability and empathy. Shame doesn't have a hold on me because I just shared with you guys what it was that I was stuck on. I don't have to worry about this guilt stirring up because I made a mistake because I know that God has covered that by the blood of Jesus. So the way that shame grows is through secrecy, silence, judgment from ourselves or from bystanders chipping in their two cents. But those are tools of the enemy. Those are not works of God. He has called us to be in relation with him and with others. He has called us to be whole and present today. Not numb and zombified just trying to survive. He wants us to flourish and to live life as a new creation. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, that's where it is, the new creation. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. And it takes time for that to happen. There's some things that need sifted, that need weeded out, some people that need to go, some new people that need to come in. Not all healing is immediate. And man, boy, that's a problem in my book sometimes. I want it now, God, come on. We've been trained, instant gratification. But doing this work, going and talking about things and, and rehashing traumas, like, now I can help other people through things. I can understand to a new level when somebody shares a, a pain or an injury 
that has carried throughout their whole life. So Romans 2, 12. Romans 12. Sorry, guys. Romans 12. Romans 12. That's, the, that's where you should find yourself. But verse 2 says, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God... Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, by transforming our minds. So we are naturally, through the world that we grew up in, the things that we experienced, are set at a default of, that's not good, that's bad, negative. The world beats us down, and we can so easily fall into that. But God says, I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left, he says, you guys will be sad because I'm leaving for a short while. But the Comforter will come. The one who will give us the guidance, the wisdom, the courage, the compassion to get through and process what it is the world and Satan has done to us. And we can minimize those things. Oh, I just, I just got short, the short stick. I just fell through the cracks. I believe that sometimes when that happens, that's the enemy taking us out of our element. We were in this lane, we were prioritizing, and then something happens, and oh! And we have a choice. Is that going to be a big upset? Or are we going to pick up where we left off? So when we ask God to reveal the Holy Spirit to us, He works in mysterious ways. In faithful, amazing ways. But he calls us to see our, our shortcomings, our character defects. I learned those through the 12-step programs. But God revealed to me different words. God has revealed to me my sins and my bad habits, also sins. God has revealed to me my sin. He convicts us of our sin. So whether we want to call it our, our white lie, our little accident, our happy mistake, whatever, sin is sin. It all leads to death. But God calls us to life. So through part of my healing journey, I heard about um, generational curses and ancestral things that carry on from generation to generation. You know, depression runs in our family. Heart disease runs in our family. This runs in our family. That runs in our family. Does anybody have something that runs in their family? The buck stops here. God can break those curses right here, right now. Why carry that any further? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, that newness, the refreshing of life comes through. So when we see, like, oh, I'm just going to live in my sadness. Depression runs in my family. I'm comfortable in my mess. I'm just going to sit here in it. <clears throat> Who am I speaking to? Because that's how we work. We get comfortable in our mess. I just want to sit in it. It's predictable. But God calls us through the Holy Spirit to seek out spiritual gifts, the unveiling and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 is where we find the spiritual gifts. It talks about praying, about preaching, about loving on people, having faith, sharing grace and mercies. And there's so many more in different places. The Bible's full of them. The spiritual gifts of God calls us to move. He stirs our hearts to do something outside of ourselves. 
when we truly receive the blood of Jesus, when we claim that he is Lord, that he died, was resurrected, and lives again, that's where the power and the authority comes from. That's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And scripture says the things that Jesus did were amazing. But his disciples, his people, you, each and every one of you, and me, will do bigger and better and greater things than Jesus himself did. So he calls us to pray. I was having a conversation with God through this. So I said, God, I want to see an arm grow out. I want to see a leg grow out. I want to see some miraculous stuff. I want some deafness to be healed. I want blind to be seeing. I want your healing to happen. And he says, well, you better start praying. Oh, man. That's our work. Our work is to pray. God is the one that does the miracles through our obedience and prayer. So I want to clarify, it's nothing that I do on my own behalf of my own will. The only thing that I do is pray and trust that God is about to handle some business. He loves you. You are his children. He has chosen, adopted you. He's done the paperwork. He has paid the price. He put forth that money through the death of his son so that we could live, be whole, be healed and restored. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh, I like that. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, we moved the table, for those of you who didn't know, it's usually here. We moved it over, and we want to sing you a song before we get into prayer. It's called To the Table. And God calls us to surrender and to sacrifice what it is we think is important. He wants us to take our priorities and to lay them at his feet. That's hard to do. Okay, some examples like it. Parents, if you have an unruly child, to take your hands off and say, God, I trust you to handle business and to leave it at that. <laughs> right? Or if we have a financial situation that is just strenuous and we can't see any hope to the end of that, and you say, all right, God, here's the checkbook. Here's my bank account. I trust you to do whatever needs done to guide me into changing things that need changed whether he nudges us to change our budget, to make cuts here and there, whatever it is, he'll speak to you. He says, bring it to the table. If you have fear, pain, if you're challenged by life, life just challenges me in general. It's hard. He says, come to the table. So that table does have paper and markers on it. I'm praying that God stirs your hearts. So if you feel that there's something he wants you to bring to the table, is open. Write something down on the paper, drop it in the offering plate. You can scribble an X. You can just write initials. God knows what it is that he's stirring in your hearts. So feel free to move about to worship him. The altar is open if you want to come kneel and pray on your own behalf. But we'll transition into uh, community prayer shortly. <laughs> 